Hello listeners, Mallory Wilsey here, chief producer of the Enrollify Network, and I want to take just a quick moment to tell you about another show on our podcast network designed specifically for all the education technology enthusiasts out there. The High Reg Geek podcast is a deep dive into the world of educational technology and its transformative impact on the student experience. Geek out each week with host Dustin Ramsdell. His conversations are a mix of engaging storytelling, expert analysis, and a genuine passion for all things higher ed and tech. Whether you're an educator or an administrator or just someone passionate about the intersection of technology and education, this podcast promises to deliver content that's both enlightening and entertaining. You can subscribe to the show by visiting podcast.enrollify.org or by searching The Higher Ed Geek wherever you get your podcasts. Income is a like gameable metric. And so we've, we've talked about test scores before, how test scores can kind of be gamed, right? If you, if you spend a lot of money on prepping for a test and you learn how to take a test and yep. you, you know, spend money on the tutor and spend money on the everything the, on the uh, literature, you know, to the study guides, all of that, right? You can drastically improve your score on a test. And so in that way, the test score is not a true metric of like, of just uh, merit across the board. It's a metric of, of how much you can afford or, or what resources you have at your disposal in order to prepare for the test and income is kind of the same way. And in, and in fact, many folks, especially on the high income earning side, will intentionally lower their income for a variety of reasons. Welcome to the EduData podcast, a podcast that serves as your weekly guide to the data driving higher education. We are your hosts. I'm Jamie Boggs. And I'm Timothy Davis. Join us every Friday for weekly breakdowns of the most important data trends and topics in higher education. The EduData podcast is a part of the Enrollify Network, a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher education professionals like you grow. Explore our other shows at enrollify.org or check out some of my personal favorites linked in the show notes below. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered, all-in-one student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the EduData podcast. I'm Jamie Boggs here with Timothy Davis with one of the more extensive studies that we've covered as of late. We're going to be talking about kind of a, a study that measures wealth versus income, but there's a lot more, a lot more to it. I guess I haven't asked you how you're doing. We do that. How are you, Timothy? We do ask how we're doing. This is my mental health check-in. I'm doing great. I'm very excited for it. At the time of this recording, we're just a few days shy of the Engage Summit. And that is a really fun time for us to get together and, and see each other in person. Jamie and I do not work in the same office. We are both remote workers. And so we don't get to see each other in person very often. And when we do, it's always a great time. Yep. Super excited for that. We may even, we haven't talked about this, actually try to record some things while we're there. So we'll see. Absolutely. A little live from Engage. There's going to be a lot of podcast recordings happening uh, on the Enrollify Network at the Engage uh, Summit. There's a lot of folks that are from Enrollify that are going to be there presenting in various capacities. And if uh, you haven't yet, at this point of, of uh, listening to this recording, you should uh, be able to access all of the recordings of every session at the Engage Summit for free um, on uh, the Enrollify website. Have a look there and check out some of those sessions. Jamie and I have a session, and uh, again, we haven't we haven't presented that at the time of this recording, but hopefully, it's it's pretty good. I've got I've got a high degree of confidence in us. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Uh, it's going to be, I mean, similar to some. Some things we talk about here, maybe some things we talk about today, but uh, we'll, we'll get there. Why don't you go ahead and introduce us to the study that we're going to be discussing? Absolutely, yeah. So this is this is another one of those kind of meta-analysis studies. We covered one a few episodes back about ROI, calculating ROI for college. But basically, a meta-analysis is when you take together multiple data sets and blend them together to answer some research questions. And that's exactly what this study does. We are covering today a study from the Institute of Higher Education Policy 
called Breaking the Cycle of Racial Wealth Inequalities and Higher Education Outcomes, How Data-Driven Insights Can Inform Policy Solutions That Address the Racial Wealth Gap. So very interesting study, again, pulling together multiple data sources, but let me kind of introduce the concept here as well. And if I can read a little bit, the reading from the introduction here for decades, assessing income has served as the tried and true method for creating financial aid packages. But what if a student's wealth status revealed more about their ability to cover college costs than their income did? So basically drawing a, a distinction between the reported income of an individual student and the wealth that they can access. So what is wealth in this context? What are we defining that as? It's frequently defined as net worth or the difference between the total value of assets, financial and non-financial, and all debts and liabilities. An individual with wealth to draw on might be able to weather a change in income in the case of, for example, losing a job, but using money and savings to cover expenses while unemployed. In contrast, people with low or no wealth may have trouble affording food and housing if their income drops suddenly. Yeah. Yes. And as you went through that, I was, there's a, a great Venn diagram here that shows wealth overlapped with higher ed in the study. And the word assets is the shortest word on that list, but I think it holds so much. We're talking savings, property, investments, huge series of, of options in that assets take. And you're right, it's, you can own all these things or have all this money invested and it doesn't show up on your taxes. It doesn't show up on your FAFSA. And that makes it a little more difficult to analyze how income impacts things if we're only considering what you're bringing in right now. I think one of the key findings of the study, let me, let me read it here. Examining income alone masks deep and persistent inequalities in wealth by race and ethnicity. For example, the analysis finds that while the median income for white households is nearly twice as large as that of black households, their median wealth is 13 times larger. So yes, there's an income discrepancy, but when examining wealth, we see just how expansive that that discrepancy is and it definitely like that applies across the board that's not just that's not just black and white homes that's that's everywhere so that i think that what you just said tells us a ton of things like even as we're closing income gaps and making more opportunities for people that have traditionally not gotten those opportunities Wealth is still a factor in that, and it's something that's going to take a lot longer to quote unquote fix than just getting people equal pay and equal opportunities at jobs. So socially speaking, I think that's huge for what it indicates. And I think when we look at higher ed or I don't know, any, anything that measures income in this way, we, we lose that. We lose that piece of the puzzle. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. We, we aren't able to accurately assess need. We aren't able to accurately assess the ability to persist, the ability to overcome challenges or overcome income-related challenges, overcome persistence-related challenges. So yeah, I think that, I think that we're on the money here with, <laughs> to, oh, that was a pun. Yeah. I didn't even do that until, I, leave that, that in. So on the On the money. <laughs> okay. So uh, why, why then is wealth a little bit more uh, accurate of a measure? And, and the reason that wealth can, can indicate these things or that, that can be a better indicator of, of need assessment is for a few reasons. The one that is highlighted in this study is that unlike income, wealth can be transferred from generation to generation. And that's where a lot of what we call like intergenerational wealth among white families comes from is grandma and grandpa built up their wealth, their savings, they bought property, they owned businesses, whatever, and then they can transfer that through a variety of, of mediums to their family members. They, they're not that income, uh, unlike income, which ends with the sole income earner, wealth can move uh, around a family. So that's, that's a huge difference in wealth. But the other one uh, is that income is a like gameable metric. And so we've, we've talked about test scores before, how test scores can kind of be gamed, right? If you, if you spend a lot of money on prepping for a test and you learn how to take a test and yep. you, you know, spend money on the tutor and spend money on the 
everything on the literature, you know, to the study guides, all of that, right, you can drastically improve your score on a test. And so in that way, the test score is not a true metric of like, of just uh, merit across the board. It's a metric of, of how much you can afford or, or what resources you have at your disposal in order to prepare for the test. And income is kind of the same way. And in, and in fact, many folks, especially on the high income earning side, will intentionally lower their income for a variety of reasons, right? Where one of those is, is to avoid a higher tax bracket. And, and this is a practice of corporations as well, is if you can bring your income down or your, or your net profit down and show, show a loss or show a lower income, right? You can reduce your tax burden and, and not have to, to be obliged that way. And then also, and, and you, you kind of have an example of this, is you can access other programs such as financial aid, or in your case, just access to an institution at all, a specific type of institution. So do you want to, you want to talk about that really quick? Yeah, I went to a work college. I went to Berea College in Central Kentucky, and it, it exists to serve high-performing, low-income students that wouldn't have a lot of opportunities otherwise, and there's no tuition. You work, but no tuition charge. There are some room and board fees. It's not completely free, but it's an awesome opportunity. But I went to school with plenty of people who had that generational wealth. Their families were were company owners or they had investments spread out. So they had that wealth. But like you said, when you're doing your taxes, you have write-offs often. You don't include all that's been just building and savings and all that interest. So I had some very wealthy classmates that got in just because their yearly income based on all that gaming you mentioned didn't break that threshold. So I'm not saying that they were manipulating it to get into that college. I think some probably did and some didn't. But it's just an example of how this can radically change opportunities. And no matter how the opportunities are changing, the wealthy are the ones controlling that change. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Your access to wealth is also probably proportional to your ability to game your income. Right. And, and that was kind of pointed out earlier in the study where like your wealth helps you weather changes in income as well. But it also helps you get down to the income number you want, just like you're making weight in wrestling, stuff like that. Yeah, and there's, like, like you said, just so many ways to, to work the tax field, to work tax brackets. So it's common and it's uh, legal in a lot of ways. So mm-hmm. this wealth piece adds such a different fundamental element here. And like you said, the study is very, very thorough. It combines a lot of different elements of data. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so there's several different data sources that are used for this study. Let me pull that section up. There's a section starting on page 10. It's in table, or excuse me, page 9. It's a labeled table 2, but basically an overview of each data set that's named. And we've got a variety of data sets here coming from various institutions, research institutions, as well as some different government agencies. But basically, finding ways to blend this data together. One of the main ways of data linkage that's used in this study is IPEDS data. So if we have a study that's about wealth and income, right, and then of that individual, we also, you know, list it like what college they attended, we can then link that over to IPEDS data and then via IPEDS data derive some information about the institution and then maybe even do a further, like a third, a tertiary join to another data set to look at like their persistence or, or, you know, how successful they were in college. Absolutely. And I, I think we cover that quite a bit on just the ability to join seemingly maybe unrelated data sets. Uh, I also very much read into this study some things like uh, when, when we do studies, we obviously look at what factors go into somebody's decision to go to college, their opportunity, the reasons they drop out. We talk about those things all the time. How do we know what's actually making the impact? I think we've mentioned it before, but for this study in particular, I think we usually put income in our studies, in our equations, in our analytical models. But we, we often don't include these other things. So how do we know which piece actually matters? It's not a situation, I don't know, I feel like growing up, if you were trying to do an experiment, you had one set of data with an, an element and one set without it, like a control, right? That's not what we have to do here. We can add these pieces in and the vast majority of analytical 
models that that determine outcomes are going to tell you what factors are important. They're usually it's usually called feature importance when you're analyzing data. It would come back and say, yes, the income matters, but the assets matter more. Or adding three these three features together is really what makes the difference, especially with the increase in artificial intelligence and machine learning. We need to just put everything we have, for the most part, into these models and let the models decide what makes the biggest impact. And then to take that information back and make it actionable for ourselves. So for this one, I think we often leave out the savings, the assets, the investments when we're looking at anything pertaining to education. So I love that this study went this direction. It shows that wealth is vastly different. That's how it starts out. Wealth is different from income. These are all the reasons why. And then this is how it relates to racial discrepancies. But I think it can relate to a lot of different things too. So Absolutely. when you're using predictive modeling or, or outcome-based modeling, make sure that you're investing in the feature importance piece that can be tweaked, that can be adjusted as you're, as you're messing with it. But there's almost as much to be gleaned from that that's actionable than the outcome itself. And I think this, this study highlights that. Yeah, I mean, if I was building a prediction model that was trying to predict like the uh, a percentage of of like uh, assistance required or resources required for a given student, yeah, I would absolutely want to put wealth, family wealth, or, or net worth in there for uh, for a feature. Yeah, and I'm I'm just thinking my way through the FAFSA. There's just so many questions on there that I think could be manipulated. I know they've. I believe they've taken some questions off about other family members that are in college or other family members that are in the household, but just being able to answer those like, well, he was in college or he's taking a cooking class. That's kind of like, there are just so many different ways to manipulate data. So data manipulation and feature discovery, feature importance, this study nails it. So if you're not interested in the content, go, le go read this for the, uh, for, for the process. <laughs> No, absolutely. And this maybe is a good transition into one of the two remaining things I think we could say about this study that are of interest to our listeners. They do have a like recommendations section starting on page 24 of this, of this report. And recommendation number three, consider designing recruitment, outreach, and admissions policies that increase access to students for low wealth, from low wealth backgrounds. Policymakers and practitioners should identify effective ways to build pathways into higher ed for students with low wealth which can spur intergenerational mobility. As we know, the college is a huge mover of intergenerational mobility and a huge driver of an individual's ability to create wealth and then thus elevate themselves and their families. And, you know, in the same way that you were kind of talking about your example where income was used as the metric, wealth is perhaps a more, a more meaningful m metric in those situations. Absolutely. And yeah, I've, I've obviously been focused on the process, but the, the implications, I think, should open our eyes to where we are in income gaps, but also tell us as, as higher ed leaders that we, we're not there. There's so much more work to be done and more things we need to think about. Not that we ever think the work's finished or we've, we've even the playing field at all, but if you think you're getting close, this is a good reality check. All right. And the one last thing I think we could say that's, that's uh, more on the fun side, more on the statistics and education side is why this is a, this is a fun question, hopefully. Why in assessments of income and wealth, do we use the median as opposed to the average? Any thoughts on why that might be just off the top of your head, Jamie? Oh yeah. So growing up, I know we heard mean, median, and mode. And mode's probably the one we use the least. That's the number that occurs most commonly in the data set. The median is the one that if you line them all up is right in the middle. And the average is add them all up and divide them by the total. And they all have different uses. And I think most of the time we default to average because in our mind that equates even and equal. But in data sets like wealth, the top is so heavy. Like the, the big numbers of wealth are so overwhelming that they pull the average up way more than it, than it would be to represent the data set. It leaves out so many people at the bottom that should be, that essentially are counted out because of that average. So yeah, I think it has to do with normalizing the data and making sure those outliers aren't skewing everything. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And the way we kind of visualize that is on a X and Y axis plot. And what we, what we expect to see of data distribution in, a, in what we call a normal setting is for the emergence of a bell curve. And so on the X axis, we've got income bracket. On the Y axis, we've got number of individuals in our data set that are in that bracket, right? So 10, 20, 100, 1,000, whatever that may be. What we expect to see is in the bottom left corner of the chart, we expect to see a few people, right? And then as we go left to right, we expect to see that number increase, increase, increase until at about the middle when it peaks out. I'm so saying like the majority of people are in the middle income bracket and then down we it go. It should look like a hill. Die. Yeah. It should look like a hill. It should look like a bell curve. Exactly. It should look like the Liberty Bell. Sure. Yeah. What a, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Shout out what, to Philly. There you go. So that's what we expect to see in a distribution of data that is normal, right? But income and wealth data is not normal. It is what we say skewed to the right so that there are a few individuals that have uh, like outlier incomes, right? Where their income or their wealth is exceptionally high. So they're really far uh, to the right of the plot. And that causes the distribution of the data to push to the left so the bell curve reaches its peak further to the left of that of that middle section of the distribution of all incomes right so right. basically what that's what that's telling us is the mean is going to be heavily affected by those outliers the mean is going to be pulled up because of those outlier incomes or the that outlier wealth is so much higher so it's not a, it's not a good representation of the middle so in a skewed right scenario or in a skewed left scenario, we can use the median as a, as a truer representation of the middle. And I think median, really the times that we use that the most are for, or for income. I don't, like, there just aren't a lot of stats that utilize that because income is the thing in the world that may be skewed the most. There are other examples, but they're few and far in between and, and they're not very, uh, common in, in education. Yeah. Again, like the default is, is always, I, I, as far as I've ever seen it is always to use the mean, which is to sum up all of the, the different values in your data set you have, and then divide that by the number of data set values you have. So your, your sum count divided by your distinct count or your discrete count where the median is just taking the, the one that's actually like in the middle. Right. And that's not I the think right way to say that, but hey. Like I said, I think we just we've normalized the language of average of oh, this is an average application, an average baseball player, an average cheeseburger. We always assume that means right in the middle, but it doesn't when when you have the best cheeseburger in the world and how great that cheeseburger is compared to just a, a cheap slab of fatty fatty hamburger, I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be skewed. But we use the word average because it's easy. In this case, it's not applicable. Right. This also makes me hungry. The statistical concept. Yeah, I think you're you're exactly right. So we need to uh, to end this episode on hamburgers. Go ahead and wrap it up there with everyone ready for some lunch. Hopefully you're, you're close to that. But thank you for joining us for this episode. We will see you in the next one. Uh, for Jamie Boggs, I'm Timothy Davis. The EduData Podcast is part of the Enrollify Podcast Network. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like the other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month. We've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea and feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Jamie Hunt, Artist Kadu, Dustin Ramsdale, Jeremy Tears, and so many of your other favorite leaders in higher ed. And Rollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered all-in-one student engagement platform helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.